Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us for the final session of the third year of the Capricorn Conference. At the conclusion of this session, our conference director, Dr. Bethany Kwan, will be joining us to give us a recap and a discussion on what's next steps. But for right now, I am honored to be leading this panel of illustrative uh, scholars that we have that are gonna be talking through um, and talking about uh, sustainment and funding and what that looks like for us as we move forward in the coming years. So we have esteemed panelists and I'm going to introduce them one by one and then we're actually going to have panel discussion questions and then we'll also be taking questions from the audience. We have Dr. Dennis Williams, who's a mixed methods health services researcher focused on improving the implementation of evidence-based home visiting programs like nurse family partnerships through program innovations, cross-sector collaboration and systems integration. She has a range of experience in health services research, including conducting health impact assessments to inform child welfare policy, evaluating systems change interventions with urban Indian health centers and developing collegiate tobacco control policies. She is passionate about engaging with communities to improve health outcomes among families experiencing adversities. Dr. Richard Duke is a biotechnology executive, inventor, biomedical researcher, and serial entrepreneurial with more than 20 years of experience in building, financing, and managing startup biotechnology companies based on inventions made in Colorado's nonprofit research institutions. He is currently the PI and co-director of the Colorado AMC Research Evaluation and Commercialization Hub, REACH, also known as the Colorado Spark Program. Dr. Duke has been involved in the formation and or management of more than 10 UC AMC spin-out companies, which as a group have raised more than $250 million in financing and have advanced nine products into phase one and two human clinical trials. In addition to his entrepreneurial activities, Dr. Duke has more than 35 years of experience in biomedical research at UMAC and has been the principal investigator or co-investigator on more than $15 million in NIH grants, including 10 SBIR grants, has more than 70 research publications and articles, and has more than 30 patents. He received the Tibbetts Award from the Small Business Administration in 2020. Dr. Duke has provided independent third-party research analyses in the life sciences sector to Janus Capital and to venture capital firms. He is a graduate of McGill University and the University of Colorado. Dr. Duke strongly believes in the merits and opportunities that arrive from building new companies based on university technologies and enjoys working with academic entrepreneurs. Marsha Ori is a Regents and Distinguished Professor, Department of Environmental and Occupational Health at Texas A&M School of Public Health in College Station, wow. Texas. Additionally, Dr. Ori serves as a principal faculty on the Texas A&M Center for Population Health and Aging, which she established in 2016. Working with interdisciplinary teams, her primary goal is to reframe healthy aging as the new normal through innovation research, education, and service. Dr. Ori is an international leader in the translation of research to practice through investigations of behavioral, social, environmental policy, and technological solutions to enhance health and quality of life for all. Julie Schwent received undergraduate degrees in industrial engineering and mathematics from the University of Missouri, Columbia, and a master's in healthcare administration from the John Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. She has built her career in the value-based program space, managing teams of administration and clinical employees, focused on improving quality and reducing unnecessary utilization within the healthcare system. Julie's expertise surrounds regulatory interpretation, contract management with payers, and finance budgeting activities and supporting the sustainment of population health resources within the patient center medical home model. We also have joining us panelist Dr. Gali Baller, who is part of the Spark Reach program, as we mentioned that Dr. Rich Rick Duke is part of, and he has spent extensive years in the entrepreneurial space and also as a central serial entrepreneur and currently works in the University of Colorado CU Innovations Center and directs that. He's also responsible for securing um, donations and filling philanthropic work in terms of supporting all of the entrepreneurial projects that take off from this campus. He has extensive experience and extensive experience not only in patent technology, but also in business startups, as well as what um, not only investing um, in uh, technologies, but also what it looks like um, to sell uh, companies as well. So 
as we have our esteemed panelists, I'm actually gonna kick off our conversation with several questions. The ask for all of those that are joining online as well as in person, please feel free to type your questions in the chat. We'll be taking those live um, as we're moving through the, the questions that we currently have, but we'll also be taking them from in-person um, folks as well. So the first question, which I'll ask, and I'll uh, personally um, direct that to uh, Julie um, and or Venice, but obviously all of the panelists can, can chime in. In your experience, what is necessary for a program to be sustained successfully in the healthcare environment or in the public health setting? I can jump in. Um, yeah, so thank you so much first for, um, for having me here today. Um, there's so there's different directions we could take this question, but um, specifically for my main role, my uh, one of my main roles is to represent our clinics in co in conversations with insurance companies, um, uh, dealing with value based contracts, population health activities. Now, our collective goal, our collect our shared interests with insurance companies is to decrease the cost of care and to improve you know, improve quality, obviously. So sustainment in the healthcare environment um, from this lens could come down to um, convincing an insurance company to potentially absorb the cost for that activity um, in, in the future. Uh, or, or if they don't, maybe we, we won't be able to do that past the grant funding. Um, so we're definitely not there yet. My team, um, myself, we meet with insurance companies. They're becoming a lot more collaborative in this space. They're wanting to hear about our research improvement activities that we're doing at our level. And then my hope is to bring those conversations more towards, okay, we've proved this to you that it works. How can you help us sustain this um, moving forward? So to summarize, just engaging with insurance companies to let them know all the good work, uh, boots on the ground work that's going on, um, I think could be one way to, to sustain uh, the funding. Yeah, that's great. Thanks so much, Julie. Um, I can kind of speak to it from, from my area of expertise, which is largely in the home visiting world um, and specifically for nurse family partnership. And for those of you who aren't familiar, it's an evidence-based nurse home visitation model for first-time mothers who are experiencing socioeconomic adversities. And so community health programs, so really thinking about the public health setting, uh, but some of our, our programs are implemented by um, health systems as well. So there's also that healthcare setting as well. And I think from our perspective is it's ongoing quality improvement um, that, that we conduct with our nurses who are conducting the home visits. We also continue to um, conduct research on program implementation. So data is collected at every home visit that then feeds into our national data collection system. And there's ongoing research and evaluation being done there. And then we also innovate. Uh, we acknowledge that this program was developed 30, 40 years ago, and a lot has changed, both in the policy realm, but also our communities and the populations that we support and serve. And so um, thinking about how do we continue to innovate our model um, and ensure that we're adapting to the needs of our families that we're supporting. Um, and in that process, having a rigorous kind of evaluation element, identifying the problems, um, looking at existing data, um, developing formative innovations, and then testing those um, in different stages before we get actually translate our learnings into practice. So um, I think there's a really interesting um, collaboration that we have where uh, us at the University of Colorado conduct most of the innovations research, um, but the implementation of the model is actually managed by a national nonprofit entity um, called the National Service Office. So there's this collaborative effort between two different organizations um, that I think is really interesting there as well that ensures that we're using evidence um, to inform our, our practices, which then our funders like. They want to see the data that we're, the, that are really informing um, their approaches and using key formance indicators um, across other home visiting models as well. So I'll stop there, but if there's other questions, happy to share. I know those were actually great um, responses. And I it, it kind of builds upon the next question that I'm going to ask. Um, the next question that I'm going to ask is because you specifically brought up the nurse uh, family partnerships and understanding kind of what that looks like um, in terms of going to, to, to folks' homes and then and, and prior, uh, the answer from Julie was around insurance uh, 
you know, trying to get a buy-in, if you will, from um, insurance to um, reimburse and or cover the cost of some of these interventions. And so what I will ask, and I'll, I'll uh, submit this uh, question specifically to Marsha, but obviously other, other panelists can chime in, which is as a, as, as a researcher, and Marsha, you, you probably have the most extensive experience here um, in this area, which is that what are the best type, what have you found to be the best type of partnerships to be helpful with building a plan of sustainment? Well, we have a model and it's called a 4C collaboration model. So C for campus, like academics, we partner with community, we partner with clinical, and we partner with corporate entities. So we partner with anybody in our space, but who we've been most successful for are people who have mission that's the same and funding streams. So we've partnered, for example, with the state of Texas. They have a program called Texercise that's government funded. So we help them sort of develop evidence base. Then they have the ability to actually implement that program. They've been implementing it for 20 to 30 years now. So find a partner with the same mission that has a funding stream. We've also been highly successful in the aging arena with the area agencies on aging because they get federal money to disseminate evidence-based programs. So my message is partner widely, but if you want to sustain in the long run, find a partner with the same mission that you have and one that will have a funding stream. That, that is a, a wonderful example of, of what it looks like to really have sustainment um, sort of built in at the beginning, right? So, so to, to begin with the end in mind, which is what, what Bethany shared with us um, at, at the outset of the conference. That leads me, Marcia, to a follow-up question um, because you spoke through or spoke about partnering um, with uh, not only the community, but obviously the state in, in this instance that had funding. So, so they already knew that they had streams um, of, of resources to be able to support this. And my question um, now kind of is secondary to that piece, which is what is the type of data or what is it that they need to hear? What is it that they need to know to determine if they in fact would not only sustain but scale a, a, a program more, more broadly? We talked a little bit about that already, but I think it's return on investment. They want to know if I give you X amount for your program, what's it going to save me, particularly healthcare, in terms of dollars or insurance companies? So I think ROI is incredibly important. So you need to know what your program costs. You need to know the training and the cost over time. And then a person who wants to sustain it can say, how do we embed that into our system? Yes, no. But I think the other thing is data that shows a significant impact. People aren't interested in a uh, statistically significant difference. They want data that shows a clinically meaningful difference. So for example, in diabetes, it's not just a nano difference in uh, A1Cs, but something that gets you in a controlled range. So think about significant impact, not just statistical impact. The other thing is in healthcare, I think they're often interested in community benefit. So they want stuff with um, customer satisfaction. So what they wanna see is that your program is gonna make their clients happier and stick with them. So the data can be very different and it depends on where you're trying to embed your program. That's really helpful, Marsha, to share that perspective. I'm now actually going to turn the conversation um, that, that kind of extends this conversation, but in, in a bit of a different direction with, with the question being geared um, for, for Rick and Golly, and that is, Everyone isn't fortunate to, to have a, a, a state that's aligned to provide the resources um, each and every time we want to implement an intervention. And with that said, 
sometimes when you're really thinking about um, widespread dissemination beyond the campus, that can be limited, particularly when you're talking about um, resources and availability of, of funding and additional support. So with respect to, to Gali and Rick, I'll ask in, in your experience, because again, they have extensive experience in terms of, of external funding, what are some creative funding resources you have found to help research teams scale and sustain their research? Um, thanks, Mitra. And I, this is a fascinating conversation. I mean, one of the areas that we primarily focus on is in uh, technology transfer. And how do we partner with outside industry um, to get some of these technologies uh, and innovations out into the commercial realm, uh, where they have existing marketing teams uh, that can engage with other health systems to help scale these technologies beyond uh, just the space of our own campus. Um, and oftentimes, in many of those kinds of relationships or partnerships, uh, there can also be additional work that needs to be done to continue developing the research beyond the initial core technology that's licensed out to an outside partner. Um, and sometimes those uh, research streams can come back in the form of sponsored research or additional uh, research studies to continue developing that technology. Um, and that way, the, the effort of having to go and market technologies uh, to the rest of the, the, the ecosystem um, really passes on to the, the a commercial entity. Um, and then the researchers can focus on just creating additional value for those technologies as they go and market. Yeah, I would add, I... There we go. Sorry. Um, it, you know, the federal government obviously funds a lot of sort of the early stage commercial pieces that is in the startup, the startup realm. And, in, and again, most of the states have, I think, adapted, uh, adopted some form of support for those. Um, Colorado has the Advanced Industries and Accelerator Program that takes care of that. And I think most, most um, states have something like that. You just have to kind of navigate through the waters. And the federal government has set up um, a, a variety of other funding mechanisms, um, uh, particularly states that have are underrepresented in terms of NIH and NSF funding have our so-called idea states. And those are often times um, have, have a multiple numbers of grant opportunities in, in the spaces that you're, um, you're interested in pursuing, um, both from the, the sort of proof of concept uh, piece, but also in terms of, of actually going out and commercializing the technology via a startup program. Um, the small business development centers that are present in almost every town um, in the states uh, in the US, you know, can also help with, uh, you know, finding opportunities. It's mostly about just locating the opportunities, I would say. I'm, I'm strictly mostly an oncology drug developer. So our early stage money tends to come from the, from the National Institutes of Health or the National Science Foundation which again are valuable resources that um, that you can you can go to um, and they do they are in areas like this and, and golly hasn't spoken much about the innovation side but um, all of them you know you just have to find you have to kind of navigate your way through it to, to find the program that's there but aging has a lot of money available um, whenever we meet with them as part of our program um, they are they are always desperately looking for both uh, small business innovative research grants, as well as uh, as, as small uh, small business technology transfer uh, grants, as well. So, all of those are agencies that you can go to, um, you know, that I think can uh, that would support this this type of research. Thank you for that answer, and it kind of leads me to the next question. Although we've talked about. Um, what funding and, and innovation looks like in the in the academic setting and, and sort of on campus, in you, if you will. One of the things that, that you've alluded to, um, Rick, is obviously the entrepreneur nature um, that a lot of these innovations and discoveries can take you. And, and given your experience and that you've, you've done this and you've uh, navigated this, I, I, I'd like for you to share and, and kind of discuss how to best manage a faculty appointment while also being an entrepreneur. Yeah, so I'm, I'm a little complicated in that area, but I'll do my, my best to do that. Um, I, I, it comes down to two things, um, transparency and disclosure in reality. Um, uh, I started here at the university in 1982. Um, shortly after I got tenure and, and promoted to associate professor in 1998, I left on a quite extended leave of absence, uh, coming back in, in 2020 as, as part of the, when I got the REACH grant funded. But um, 
that I would say the reason I managed to do that was really because I was always very clear with um, the dean, with my division head, um, everyone exactly what I was doing and where I was and why this was a benefit to the university. And I think that that's been part of it, I think, is that there has to be some kind of benefit, obviously, to the university as well, if you're going to try to take these, you know, leave time. But it is something that you have to consider is it, it takes a significant amount of time and effort to put into this. And there, there has to be a balance between your, your day job and, and the, next, the next step potentially in your career. So, um, but again, I, I think the reason I've been able to do that really was really the transparency and the, and the full disclosure of what I was doing. Um, and then things have changed dramatically at the university and CU Innovations is a, is a great place to start with that. It's, a, it's um, you know, they have a, a large number of people that can help with the startup um, entities. Um, they've had now experience with a lot of startups um, in particularly in the innovations uh, sector that you guys are in. Um, and they're just a very valuable resource that I certainly, we did not have when I, when I left 20 years ago. So again, um, a, a really good place. And I think you'll find that, you know, I, I interact with the other hubs. There are five of our hubs. There are something like uh, 12 um, idea state development centers. We interact with all of them. Um, and I would say most, most universities now are doing a much better job for those of you who aren't here at Colorado. Most universities are doing a very good job about doing that stuff. May I add a comment to follow up on that? So what we're doing in Texas, and I wonder if they're doing it in Colorado, for promotion and tenure, they're actually taking account of patents and commercialization in the same way that traditionally you count grants and publications. Is that something that's happening in Colorado? Unless Golly's got more information, I, we are working on that to my knowledge. Um, I just went up, I finally, because I came back as an associate professor and went through the uh, promotion thing there, I was actually surprised that there were, we don't have a track for that in particular, but there are promotion criteria around that. Um, we have been, um, I, I at least have been speaking, and I know um, uh, Dimitri's uh, colleague in the i -Corps program has been talking to a variety of universities that have set this up, like Michigan is the one that I think is one model. They've had it for quite a number of years where they actually have a separate track for, for that includes that. But it was definitely, uh, I, was, I was actually pleasantly surprised to see that in our, our promotion that um, at least those, those categories were there. Guy, were you going to add? I didn't know. No, I mean, the, the only thing to add is, yeah, we're working on it. <laughs> it is a yeah. challenge. And I, I think the key challenge there is really finding the right metrics and criteria to, to put up for those uh, pathways. Um, within the legal realm on IP, we can get a patent on almost anything, um, a way to swing on a swing side to side. Uh, but the question is, is that really valuable for the marketplace? Are we creating impact there? And so I, I think there needs to be long-term consideration for some of those pieces. And that can be a challenge in terms of looking at uh, long-term impact versus short-term things like publications and grants. Um, and so trying to find those right metrics, um, I, I think are uh, is something that we're working on right now. Yes, I think that's absolutely right, is that it, it is... I think that's absolutely right. Um, in terms of uh, university, all universities uh, collectively are not there yet. There are some leading um, and farther along down the path than others. However, it does seem like there, there's definitely not only interest, but uh, structures being put into place to recognize not only the entrepreneurial spirit that, that lays bare on campus among all of the scholars, but also the fact that it's almost necessary if you want to maintain this type of talent uh, in an academic environment, because a lot of folks are beginning to move in this direction or at least have interest in this direction. And so it's, it's almost as if it's a part, if you will, of the academic climate, and it definitely should be adopted as such. Right before we, oh, go ahead. Yep. Yeah, I, I think I, I just like to add, I mean, it, it's the same thing as it is to the insurance company. What value do you add? I think if you add value to the university, they shouldn't have any problem with you, you're doing things. I, I agree with Golly that sometimes it's hard to show that value, but 
it's all in alignment with the mission of the university. It should be something that you, you just have to be able to explain the value proposition at the end of the day. So uh, coming back to probably i core and, and value propositions, it, you know, that, that's where it is. It's the same thing you're pitching to the insurance company, to potential partner, to people who want access to your data. It's what, what value add is there. And, and I, I think it works inside. It's been, it's been fine for me. I managed to do it and I think most people could do it. Uh, Gala, we have a question for you from Russ in the chat. I'll just go ahead and read that aloud in light of time. Uh, Russ is asking, uh, Gala, can you say a bit more about metrics that assess impact? It's so important. Does the panel thing that TSBM talked about um, earlier in the conference is applicable in your REM? I'm happy to try and answer. I, I'm not sure I'm familiar with TSBM. What the acronym means. What, Dimitri, I think you're on mute. Hey, Russ. Um, yeah. Science benefits model. Yeah. Sorry. Um, our keynote speaker on day one has a model that's used by a lot of the uh, translational science consortium programs around the country uh, by uh, get it right, translational science benefits model. And it kind of specifies using a logic model, different types of uh, impacts. And I think it's been discussed a lot about community-based partnerships and things. But my, I, I guess uh, it, probably we don't have time to go into or my inadequate explanation of it, but I'm just wondering, maybe just go back to the original question about what metrics you might be. In my limited experience, you know, people want something more tangible. I mean, we think stories are important and things, but I'm just wondering about are there quantifiable metrics or things in your area that, that could be put forward? Sure, absolutely. I mean, from our venture and investment lens, some of the things that we consider in our metrics are number of patients reached, um, number of lives saved. Um, uh, one of the, the technologies that came out of the campus was a drug for uh, shingles vaccine. Um, and uh, we calculated four different parameters around that. Uh, one was the number of patients uh, that were, um, as a vaccine, did not get shingles. Um, how many patients did we avoid hospitalizations or downstream infections? And then ultimately, how many lives were saved uh, with this medication? But that was a metric over uh, decades of, of time. And so, you know, for short-term parameters and things looking at promotion, we can't necessarily wait a decade to see if that's a metric that's going to feed in. So I, I think there's a spectrum of different parameters that we should consider. Patents are certainly one that we can uh, include that are shorter time periods. Um, but I think they all come into a, a collective understanding of how are you engaging with the ecosystem? How are you generating additional follow-on funding for your research project? And how are you striving towards uh, getting these technologies out to scale and to impact in the broader community beyond just the, the, sort of the research environment? And so I think they all collectively combine um, uh, from the ultimate goal of you know, saving lives or, or improving quality of life all the way to the earlier stages of innovation in sort of a, a, com a, a comprehensive metric. I would, I would um, be happy to put you in touch. Michigan has a quite advanced system on this and they they have some metrics. I think if you check their their uh, website of how they they look at that, we spent some time talking to them uh, about their what they've been doing. I think they've been running it for about 10 years now. This is kind of an extension of that question, Russ. So, so appreciate you, you, you asking it. Um, and Marsha, Julie, and, and Venice, in, in your experience, um, since we are talking about kind of what, that's essentially what we're, we're getting at is sort of what matters, right, um, to your respective audience. And so when you're talking about, for example, a hospital system, when you're talking about academic leadership, if you're talking about promotion, right, each audience has a different parameter about not only what's valuable uh, to them, but what they have a, a job to get done. And so they are responsible, if you will, for certain outputs in their, their respective roles. And so as an extension of, of Russ's question, I'm curious when you're thinking about um, healthcare systems or, or even insurance uh, companies, since we that was brought up earlier um, in the discussion, what are some of the outputs that you've 
shown and or demonstrated to be able to, to confirm and garner that buy-in so that you were able to continue working with um, a particular organization or a community and, and continue doing the work and even have them potentially adopt it as their own. Demetria, one of the things that this reminds me of is way back when we would ask our partners what their success metrics are. So academics may have one set. So I think the first thing is to make sure that the metrics are meaningful to the audience. And so if you're working in healthcare, you, you could even say, we assume that this would be important to you. Is it important to you? What else? I think as an academic, if you go in with your set of metrics, they may or may not match. Yeah, 100% uh, agree. I'll, I'll piggyback off that with, with, in my role with the insurance companies, that oftentimes they're, they're throwing at us all these different clinical quality metrics that were graded on in our value-based programs. And the list, I mean, it can be 100 plus quality metrics. So what we've done is we try to help our clinics prioritize these quality metrics from the interest of all of those different stakeholders that you, that you just mentioned. So we'll, we'll look at it uh, almost like a three-legged stool, clinical fe feasibility on how to attack that metric. Um, there's the business piece, how much money will we, could we earn if we, if we improve that metric, but then also, and most importantly, the effect on the patient. So that's how we try to prioritize um, in our pop health space. Yeah, those are those are great examples. I think in the in the home visiting world, um, at least in, for nurse family partnership, many of our program sites there's over 260 across the nation, 40 states. So there's a lot of local sites that's really scaled up program. Um, but many many of our programs are largely funded by the Maternal Infant Early Childhood Home Visiting Program or MCV, which is funded federal funding um, through the Affordable Care Act initially, um, and there's. I think there's overnight, there's like 19 measures of um, across six different domains of largely improvements in maternal and newborn health, um, prevention of child injuries and e ER visits, um, improvements in child school readiness and child academic achievement, um, reductions in crime, domestic violence, improvements in family economic self-sufficiency, um, and improvements in coordination or referrals across other systems and services. So I think a lot of these relate back to, to dollars um, and and how um, ins payers and insurers, or insurers might be interested in that as well. And so I think it's, it's that combination um, of collaborating with your funders to really identify what are the common elements that really uh, we're all interested in improving um, and, and really, you know, uh, pertaining to that. So, um, that, that, so this is a really great discussion and I really like a couple of the points that you all um, have brought up and I'll extend that because we have a question from the audience and this will actually be the last question um, before we conclude the conference for this year. And it's an extension, Venice, of actually something that you said, which is you said, gosh, it comes down to dollars. And so this question, um, I'll kind of rephrase it. It's, it's almost like, well, whose dollars are they? And so this question comes from Michelle in the audience and it says, one idea that has come up previously in relation to value and payment is the wrong pocket problem. How do you overcome this situation that is when the payer is not the same person or the group that's actually receiving the benefit? Yeah, I, I, I can jump in and, and I hope this gets at the question, but really that's that's a huge piece of what our department does is trying to align um, the incentives with um, the work that our providers and clinics are already doing. Uh, we're already providing great quality care, trying to um, help the patient um, you know, reduce unnecessary um, health care utilization, but our providers in the past have not been paid for that work. So now fast forward, we're trying to work with the healthcare insurance companies so that we actually are aligned with the payment incentives for, for doing the, 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 all the quality initiatives that they're doing. Any other panelists have response or comments? For yeah, that? I mean, I think I think really understanding the dynamics between the payers and the, the beneficiaries of those plans um, and how they work together and what the, what are the objectives and incentives um, to what Julie had mentioned is important to understand. Um, there's some projects that we've been working on that uh, have been in the provider space, getting providers to pay for the last six, seven years. Now that they've collected enough data, really the payers should be covering this, this uh, platform. And now they're seeing that the payers are actually willing to pay three to four times more for the same platform because they have better visibility into that same pipeline. So 
developing time, uh, developing the data to then go and convince the right pocket to then cover it um, is certainly another way to, to drive, drive, strive towards uh, sustainability. I'll just add one more quick thing. I know we're running out of time, but um, I think it's it's really interesting, right? I think it is, is tailoring to the needs of, of these individuals. And so um, we have two implementing sites that are solely funded. One is Texas Children's Health Plan that funds the entirety of the implementation of the program. And the other is, is Carl Foundation, which is um, in Illinois, it's a hospital system that is 100% funded purely through the foundation of the hospital. And they've what they what, the reasons why is because they know they're gonna save money in the long run. And so investment of, of early childhood and these young families that are experiencing adversities will save the money in terms of accessing care later on in life. I think that's the biggest uh, incentive there for, for these particular examples. Thank you for that. Right before I, I close out, Marsha, I see you nodding a great deal. I didn't know if you wanted to, to chime in and share a bit of your expertise as well. I only have one thought. I've been thinking about sustainability for over 20 years. And when I started, it was like more of an art. Now I think it's both art and science. It's not easy. I think every situation is different. So I think that's the message is you want to try towards sustainability. There are many pathways, not just one. That would be my final comment. Thank you for that. That is actually a great uh, final comment, if you will, for this panel. I want to thank everyone that was able to join online as well as in person for this panel discussion. It really has been an opportunity to, to coalesce great minds around this particular subject. And it's been a, a real joy to sort of not only lead uh, the questions that we have here, but also engage in this very wonderful conversation and discussion. So with that, this panel will conclude and we will turn it over to our conference director, Dr. Bethany Kwan, for closing remarks.